I'm Dr. Carla Turner, author of Into the Strange and Taken, Inside the Alien-Human Abduction Agenda. What you're about to hear are the voices of the Taken, six women whose experiences are recounted along with four others, in Taken. On Friday, you will meet Anita and Amy, both of whom live in Texas, and Beth, who lives in Puerto Rico. On side B, you will meet Angie in Tennessee, Jane, another Texan, and Polly, who lives in the Adirondack Mountains. Hello, my name is Anita. I'm in my late 40s. I've been married for 30 years this, this April to the same guy. I have three grown children and four grandchildren. I was born and raised in Texas and have lived here all my life. My main interests are reading and music, with side interests in the study of religion, psychology, and holistic medicine. My first actual sighting of a UFO didn't occur until my early teens, when I lived in the country with my parents and brothers and sisters. My older brother yelled for us one night to come and look out the bedroom window. We all went running to the window and looked out. About half a mile away was a string of colorful lights moving just above the tree line to the south. It was moving west to east. My first encounter with a euphonaut occurred many years before when I was around four or five years old. He was totally human and was dressed in a red flight suit. People didn't wear red back then. I guess I'm aging myself when I say that, but it's true. People didn't wear loud colors like that when I was a child. Maybe that's why I remember it so well. He has been with me telepathically since then. I've also met at least one gray. He doesn't like humans at all. One sharp blue being and the tans who seem to be somewhat more inclined to be friendly than the grays. The human was, to use my daughter's slang, a hunk. Gray was taller than me and was accompanied by the blue who was shorter than me. They were walking ahead of me down a curving corridor and silly me was trotting along behind them like a good little girl. I remember looking down at the blue and thinking I had never seen a blue person before. When I thought this, he turned and grimaced at me. I guess it was a grin, but it looked more like a grimace. After the second encounter with the red-seated humans when I lived in South Texas, I came down with a ringworm-like rash that lasted for six weeks, and this was 20 years after the first remembered encounter. With the tans and the grays, I can always count on a violent headache the next morning, accompanied by nausea and vomiting. Sometimes the headaches last for a week. My telephone acts crazy sometimes. Toward the middle of January of this year, my phone rang and I picked it up. There was no one on the line, but the line was open. I could vaguely pick up a conversation on the line, but, but it was more like a cross conversation. That wasn't too bad, but the eerie thing is I have two lines on the phone and could not, couldn't get either line to disconnect from the phone call. I hung up, waited a minute, and then picked up the phone again. The lines were still open. There are times when I can be sitting and reading and all the power in the house will just shut down. Sometimes it's back on within minutes. Other times it will be off for up to 30 minutes or more. We've had to buy alarm clocks with battery backups so we don't oversleep in the mornings. I've heard the clicking sounds in the middle of the night just before I get the old familiar electrical zap and then I'm out until morning. I've been the recipient of the electrical zap all my life. Until I started reading about UFO abductions, I thought everyone had these zaps, so I never thought of them as peculiar. The zaps aren't painful. It's like getting shot, but without any associated pain. It goes through the center of my body. There are, however, sometimes powerful enough zaps that they make me sit up in bed. As far as family involvement goes, the majority of my family has been involved in some way with UFO activity. Both of my sisters, my daughter, and myself have a brown mark on our left leg between the knee and ankle. Mine is on the right inner side of my left leg. My brothers who drive trucks have not only seen UFOs, but have been followed by them. My youngest sister feels compelled at times to drive out to the country and lie down in her car and go to sleep. She will awaken in an hour or so and drive back to town. The only thing I know for sure is this. Whatever their reasons for being here, and they've been here for a very, very long time, we haven't been seriously injured. If they wanted to kill us or take over the planet, they would have done so. I hope in the not-too-distant future we'll find out what their purpose is. Maybe they're here to help, maybe not. 
but in the meantime, all we can do is keep reading books like Carla's and try to find out what's going on with people. Thank you. This is Amy. Question number one. Give a little of your background, mom, with two school-aged children. We live in the North Texas area near the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and I'm a counselor and an amateur videographer. On January 14, 1994, about 1.43 p.m. in the afternoon, I was sitting in my car eating my lunch when I saw about four objects flying in a V formation towards me. As the objects got closer, I got out of my car for a better look. I could see the tail sections, but no wings, and there was no sound. I figured they were just planes with very small wings. Sure. The planes turned to the southwest, and just as they got right over the Dallas-Fort Worth airport, they suddenly started merging together. I was standing about one mile from the airport. In less than two or three seconds, they all merged into one object, and stayed as one object as they flew off to the southwest. I could not believe what I had seen. I'd heard of objects merging into one, but I didn't believe it really happened. I was totally unprepared for what I saw. After the initial shock wore off, I spent the next four hours trying to find a logical explanation for what I'd seen. I could only come up with one, and it still didn't fit, no matter how much I tried to explain it away. Three. A physical description of what you would call about two or three of the entities you have encountered. Well, I guess if I have seen any entities, uh, it would be the gray ones, the tall ones, and what Barbara Bartholik calls a uh, hybrid. Uh, the gray ones, I don't remember much about except the one that I saw with the big eyes behind the mask and all I remember is seeing her eyes. They were very shiny. Um, I remember they, they looked bald. Uh, and their necks seemed to have ridges, little tiny ridges in them, like, uh, almost like you could see the bones through them, but they're real skinny little necks. And they were short. Um, in contrast, the tall ones were six feet to almost seven feet tall, I guess, from what I remember. And very thin and uh, wearing long robe-like clothes or something. No hoods, just long clothes, maybe. I'm not too sure about the details. They had big heads, sort of like the grays, but that's all the features I remember about the tall ones. I've never remembered their eyes or anything else yet. Um, I have not remembered faces very well at all. Um, the hybrid one that I saw uh, looked normal in all other ways. He looked like a regular businessman, had very silver gray hair, kind of an average build. And he wasn't short or tall, he was kind of medium. But he had yellow-green eyes that were slit in the middle. Um, and he knew how to talk with his eyes. And that's about all I remember of any entities that I may have seen. Number four, describe to, describe to some degree one alien encounter. Uh, one, one, perhaps a dream experience or whatever, but I remembered it as a dream, was of an alien uh, uh, working on a bunch of abductees on tables. And I was buzzing the heck out of him, trying to make him stop. And then he turned, and it was my turn, and I guess this encounter sticks out in my mind with most feelings and emotions to it because it, it really stuck with me. And when it was my turn, I realized that, you know, there was nothing I could do. And it, I couldn't appeal to his feeling to mercy because he had no feelings. There was no feelings at all. And that was just the most outstanding effect that I noticed was that... I, I've never met anybody who didn't have feelings before. I didn't remember, I don't know how to deal with somebody who is not human. And it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's like with somebody who might mug you or something, You at least you'd know that they're human and they might show 
mercy and I'm not kill you or anything and that there's some kind of hope there there's some some kind of expectation of what that person might feel but with aliens who don't have feelings or emotions you don't know how to deal with it you don't know how to react to the lack of feeling or the lack of emotions there's no no humanness to appeal to it. There's no no way to talk to them. There's no common ground for communication, actually. So I just remember that encounter as being very, very vivid and very startling to me because I just, it was so unknown to face someone who didn't have feelings. I didn't know how to react to it and I didn't know how, what to think. Number five. Uh, describe one example each of some external effects or events that there was a phenomena such as bone disturbances, etc. Well, uh, some of the disturbances or external effects that I've noticed with this phenomenon is uh, that our phones tend to ring with no one on the line quite several times a day. Uh, the phone tends to beep around 11, between 11 to 11, 12 every night uh, when all the light bulbs and batteries seem to go out at one time. Uh, street lights go out when we pass under them. One night we counted three lights going out as we passed them, and another night it was four nights, etc. Um, black helicopters have flown over our house, um, and on a couple of occasions I've heard of helicopters either circling our house or buzzing our house real low. Um, I've also heard some beeping sounds in the house that I could not account for. Number six, involvement of other family members. I would like to think that no one else is involved, but my oldest daughter, who is called Grace in the book, me one day that she sees little balls of light that fly in the house, sometimes outside. She described them as uh, two sizes. One is about two inches in diameter, the other one's two to three feet in diameter. The little ones, she said, fly in a jerky pattern, and she said that they disappear when she tries to catch them. The big balls of light she described uh, as being very bright in the middle and having sparkle or sparkly stuff coming from around the edges. Um, she said that one night I was talking to her about it and kind of playing the devil's advocate and going, you, you really don't see it. What do you see? And she told me all more and more about it. And, and she said, but Mommy, I thought everybody saw these things. And that really hit me hard because I thought everybody had the same experience as I did too when I was about her age. I thought the same way she did. She also has recurring nosebleeds. This is Beth. But on July 17, 1978, around 9 o'clock, uh, my children were already in bed. My husband was watching a TV program, so uh, I went to bed with a book. And about 10 o'clock, I turned the light off. And um, as soon as I turned, I felt and I saw a light coming through the windows. And I called my husband and told him, and he went out to find out what was happening because uh, we thought that it was the thief. You know, somebody a uh, shining light in, into the bedroom so he went out, he didn't find anything, and he came back again. But as soon as, as I turned back again, uh, I saw the light come in through the window again. And the next thing I know is that I'm in a round metallic room, uh, sitting there with my husband and other people. My husband was to my left, and he was asleep. Uh, my youngest child was in my lap, and he was asleep too. There was this uh, 
all the men to my right. Somehow I got the impression that he had been in the military, that, um, well, I don't know, something about him told, told me that he had been in the military. And there was um, a young girl in her 20s, early 20s, and a young man in his early 20s, too. Uh, both of them were asleep, too. Uh, the old man sitting to my right seemed to be uh, coming out of this trance or this uh, sleeping state almost at the same time as I did. Uh, so I asked him, very surprised, what time is it? And he says, it's 10 after 12. So I told him, my God, how many things have happened in such a short time? I don't know why I said that because I had no uh, recollection of anything happening. But uh, then I started looking around. I was more surprised than afraid. And I saw all this machinery going around the room. It was like a computer, so what I said was a computer bank. And then I noticed these two small figures, uh, these two beings, uh, they were big-headed, bald, no ears, uh, with very big dark eyes, and just a slit for a mouth, and no nose, just two little holes. And the bodies were so skinny, and uh, they were dressed in, in kind of a metallic, looking uh, silvery jumpsuits that was very tight. So uh, I, I was very surprised to see them, but they didn't seem to notice us. They were just doing something with this machinery. Then I looked to my left and I saw that my husband was uh, starting to wake up and then I noticed uh, to the front of the room that the metallic wall turned into uh, a glass window. I don't know how it could happen, but uh, it did happen. And I could see out and I could aden uh, identify the place where I was because it was uh, a place close to the, to the place where we had this piece of land. But I was looking at this place from another from the, uh, from the other side of the river. There was a river, and I had never been on that side of the river, but still I could identify by the houses and the road and everything, the place where, where we were. Uh, I noticed too that wherever we were was higher than the ground, and we were looking down. And then I looked back at my husband, and this, door open to the side and this very tall man uh, came in. This man was very pale and the impression that I got it is that it's somebody who had never been exposed to the sunlight and uh, he had dark hair uh, with a widow's peak uh, it was short hair, uh, his eyes were bigger than ours, his features were very fine, and his uh, face, you know, around the jaw was square, and his lips were very fine, and um, he was dressed in, in the same kind of uh, clothing that a small creatures were dressed, uh, tight-fitting, silvery kind of jumpsuit, and it seemed that his boots were part of the uh, whole outfit. Uh, he, had a, he had a belt, a white belt on his waist, and he had gloves, he had gloves uh, on, and he was holding 
on his right hand um, a ball, a kind of a glass ball with a with many lights, tiny lights inside it, it, it and it looked like they were turning on and up, on and up. It was so pretty. And then he stood there and he looked at us directly at us and uh, somehow I I was uh, afraid of him well not really afraid but but he gave me an impression of a of being a scientist and and I was I felt uh, that he was a very imposing figure like somebody in command and at the same time I felt that he was a scientist uh, or a doctor and that stare that he gave us was like a like a scientist when he's looking at these uh, little animals in a laboratory with no emotions at all it was uh, and I felt like I was a guinea pig like uh, I was um, part of some kind of experiment with something it was an ugly feeling really an ugly feeling and uh, at that time, my husband was waking up, and he looked straight at him, and then he came into the room, stood in front of my husband, put his hand uh, over his head, turned his hand, and the thing is that this crystal ball didn't fall off. It just stayed there like it was a kind of a stuck there. and. He fell asleep again, and then he moved to me, and somehow I knew that that if he did that to me, I was gonna feel uh, like a tingling feeling, and I was going to be paralyzed. Then I told him, "Please, not again," which implies that I knew what was gonna happen or what. Uh, could happen if he uh, put that ball, little ball, over my head, and he did it. He put his hand over my head, and I felt what I thought, or what I knew that was going to happen. And the next thing I know, oh, uh, I forgot something. Uh, before he came in. I thought, where are my other children? Where are they? And a voice in my head told me, don't be afraid, they are here and they are okay. So I felt like, uh, like it was okay. Like it was okay with them. So uh, after he put his hand over my head with that little ball, and I uh, started feeling this tingling feeling and everything. The next thing I know is that I'm on my bed and and that I have a terrible headache. But I went to sleep again. In the morning, when I woke up, oh, excuse me if I uh, sound funny, but uh, I have a cold and this cold breeze is blowing in and my nose feels stuffy so excuse me okay so in the morning when I woke up uh, I felt awful I had this uh, terrible pain in my head and my body was aching all over especially my back uh, it felt like uh, I had been uh, lying on a very hard surface and I was dizzy and I could hardly, hardly see because uh, my eyes were um, very irritated. So uh, I got out of the bed and I went into the into the bathroom and when I look at myself in the mirror I was surprised to uh, see my eyes were swollen were red and I had this I found that I had this uh, 
rash on my chest and my upper abdomen and then I started feeling nauseous and I started throwing up and well as the day went by I uh, had diarrhea and I started falling off after that I found out that this rash would not go away it lasted uh, for about two months uh, I developed a terrible fear so every night when I went to bed I had to leave the lights on and I had a stick there with me because somehow I was afraid of somebody getting into the room and I didn't know why uh, another thing was uh, my eyes I had to start uh, wearing dark glasses every day since I got up till night and even the lights in the house at night would hurt my eyes so so many things were happening I, I don't remember I don't remember about my husband or the children but I know that the children were, were anxious they were kind of afraid uh, at night time when they went to bed uh, so many times they woke up like um, with a nightmare or something like that uh, all the lights and the electrical uh, everything it was um, like the lights were always uh, blowing blowing out and we had to keep changing the lights you know the bulbs and the electrical uh, things uh, started malfunctioning and it was weird it was scary I developed this uh, thing about that house I felt people moving around I was so nervous all the time and at the same time it was like a nervous irritation uh, everything bothered me I was um, my nerves my nerves were raw I think and it seems that all of us were like uh, under some kind of a stress I'm in my late 20s, married, and currently live in East Tennessee. My husband and I are in the beef cattle business. I was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, and raised with my two brothers and two sisters in North Georgia. For most of my life, I have had an intense passion for art and presently specialize in cartooning, lithography, and sculpting. I never considered putting my work on public display but now I plan to submit some of it to local craft shows and museums in the future. Before 1988, I had no memories of ever having been physically abducted by alien beings. And before 1988, I had no interest in occult or paranormal matters. I was just a normal person living an ordinary lifestyle. Ordinary were my perceptions of reality, mode of personal experiences, and state of mind. The aliens made themselves known to me when I least expected and altered what was an ordinary state of mind, and they transformed what was an ordinary way of life into an extraordinary experience. I will describe one sighting of a UFO. On December 25, 1991, my sister and I enjoyed a memorable Christmas with our mother in North Georgia. We visited for five days and left around 4.30 during the afternoon of the 29th. Something extraordinary happened to us on our way back to Tennessee. As usual, I was doing the driving and decided to take the easiest and quickest route back home. By 7.30, we were about half the way home 
and we found ourselves stuck behind an old bus just creeping along at a snail's pace. I could not pass the vehicle because we were in a no-passing zone and moving uphill at the time. All of a sudden, a few of the passengers on the left side of the bus pulled open their windows and started shouting something. One guy pointed toward a bright blue object which hovered above the treetops some distance ahead. Angie, look, my sister shouted. At that moment, the object appeared to be slowly heading in our direction. Janet got a little excited and slapped the dashboard and said, That's a UFO. I saw that the object appeared to be disc-shaped and wingless. And as it came closer, I realized it really was a UFO, complete with dome, round black portholes, and a ring of blue and white lights. I felt a tingling sensation when the thing zoomed past us. Suddenly, the old bus moved on up to about 40 miles per hour and kept picking up speed until it was out of sight. Quite unexpectedly, my Corvette's engine went dead. The headlights dimmed to a pale yellow, and the eight-track machine quit playing. My car gradually came to a complete stop. It was clear to me what was happening. I had read a few books that portrayed stories about UFOs affecting car engines, and electrical equipment, and stories about people being picked up by UFOs while driving through a desolate area at night. My blood ran cold. A blue glow filled the car. Janet screamed, Oh God, it's behind us. Suddenly fearful, she scrambled for the floorboard area and pulled her coat over her head. I began to experience a dizzy sensation and heard an intermittent beeping sound and this persisted for what seemed like only 30 seconds. The next thing I knew, the car's headlights became real bright, and the 8-track machine, radar detector, and heater were all working just fine. But the engine was still off. When I turned the key in the ignition, the car started immediately. There was no UFO to be seen. I told my sister it was okay for her to get up. God damn it, Angie, let's go, was her exact response. We got the heck out of there. Fifteen minutes hadn't passed when I heard Janet say, Do you know what time it is? It's 10.20. I thought, it can't be. But my own watch read 10.20 just as well. We looked at each other, ultimately perplexed. Three hours of missing time, and neither of us had any memory of an abduction experience. The strange encounter still haunts us to this day. Here is a physical description of what I recall about two of the entities I have encountered at underground ET government facilities. On November 9, 1993, I was examined by a being that closely resembled an oriental person. I sensed this being was a male. He appeared to be about four and a half feet tall, had thick white hair, a large forehead, slanted blue eyes, and with yellow complexion. His legs were short, his arms were long, and his hands and wrists were unusually large. He was clad in white doctor duds and sported a stethoscope. This being spoke telepathically. On January 8, 1994, I encountered two gray entities at one of the underground ET government facilities. These beings were about four and a half feet tall and extremely thin. They had large bald craniums, pointed chins, and glittery black almond-shaped eyes. The color of their skin was a light gray with a tinge of almond, and their complexions were smooth and unwrinkled. These gray beings also spoke telepathically. I will describe one abduction encounter. Sometime between 2 and 6 o'clock on the morning of August 10, 1993, I was abruptly taken out of a normal dream and found myself sitting in a chair in a small operating theater, possibly on board an alien spacecraft. 
I was partially paralyzed. Through the corner of my left eye, I could see a gray beam and a group of men and women. These were busy working on an oblong object that appeared to be connected to the ceiling. And through the corner of my right eye, I could see the back of someone's shiny bald head. At first, I assumed it was one of the aliens. Only after the person spoke did I realize this was my father. I was unable to get my head turned to view what was going on with him. I do recall hearing my father laughing at one point. One of the women from the group came over and put a tiny white tablet in my mouth and asked me to swallow. She never explained what the tablet was for, but did tell me there would be some side effects. This is all I was able to remember of this particular encounter. For the next three and a half days, I experienced double vision, vertigo, and some pain behind my right ear. These side effects gradually disappeared. My father also recalled being abducted on August 10, 1993, but his account was slightly different than mine. I will give examples of some of the external effects related to this phenomenon. During the past six years, there has been a lot of phone disturbances and oddities, electrical disturbances, mystery helicopter overflights and such at my home. The phone oddities occur at least three times a week. I have five phones in my house. Sometimes only one will ring. Other times I'll ring simultaneously, and when I pick up one of the receivers, the other phones will continue to ring. Sometimes the lights will dim or there is a power outage in my home when I think about the aliens or my abduction experiences. My home is buzzed by mysterious black helicopters and noiseless C-130 cargo planes more than twice a week. Stereos and televisions often switch off and on when I get within eight feet of them. Car engines seem to stall when I get in or near them. I will describe a little of the involvement of other family members. A few members of my family have either been physically abducted by aliens or have sighted UFOs on more than one occasion. When my mother was eight months pregnant with me, she had a bedroom encounter with a tall being who was wearing a black hooded cape. The being told her that he'd come there to take me away from her. Mom said the being disappeared when it sensed her anger. My father and two of his friends were camping in the foothills of the Smoky Mountains in August 1981 when they witnessed three noiseless triangular objects zoom past them at a high rate of speed. My grandmother witnessed a bright white UFO at close range when she was about 10 years old. She said the object was as bright as the sun. Her sighting lasted almost half a minute. In early 1966, my mother and father were traveling through Greenback, Tennessee late one afternoon when a black UFO the size of a car plunged into the back of their Chevy. They heard a loud noise which Dad described as sounding like a million crickets. My mother was pregnant with me during the time this incident occurred. My sister and her husband witnessed a UFO land on the side of a mountain in Townsend, Tennessee. The situation, interest, where you live, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm Jane G. I'm in my early 50s. I was born and raised in Central Texas. I'm a sixth generation Texan. I'm one-eighth Cherokee, one-eighth Creek, and an unknown amount of Apache thrown in there, plus Irish, English, Holland Dutch, German, and French background. 
I'm a retired nursing professional with active interest in history, archaeology, journalism, painting, rock art, singing, and last but not least, Mother Earth. Describe one sighting of a UFO. The first UFO I ever saw was August 12, 1992. My mother and I were out watching the meteor showers early in the morning and about 5.30, give or take a little. We both observed extraordinary moving lights in the sky, doing intricate maneuvers, things that planes could not do, two bright lights in a small portion of the sky, doing figure eights and circles and other maneuvers. We watched this extraordinary display for about 15 or 20 minutes and we talked about it all day. I had previously known about UFOs or they were the fringe thing, you know, but when I saw my first ones, things haven't been the same since. Give a physical description of what you recall about two or three of the entities you have encountered. I have had contact with short grays. I'm, I don't know if they were three and a half or four and a half foot tall. I had nothing to compare it to at that moment. They had sharply pointed chins and wore w robes with long sleeves. I have encountered beings of light and I have had encounters with robed figures that would resemble the Nord Nordics or the Swedes with the fair colored hair, the beautiful eyes, the blues, greens, hazel eyes. They seem, seem to emanate light. That's essentially what I have encountered. And these encounters have been in, in different ways. Some recalled by hypnosis. Uh, one occurred through telepathic communication, overwhelming telepathic communication. Number four, describe to some degree one alien encounter. Well, one of mine was in December of 92 when I again received overwhelming telepathic contact and I was uh, told to get my camera, clean the lens and get new batteries and get ready. This was at three in the afternoon. There was no doubt that this was telepathic communication. It was overwhelming. I was to go out about six o'clock and wait a UFO would come over and I would be able to obtain a picture. It did and I did. There have been other examples of telepathic communication and that was one of the overwhelming ones. Describe one example each of some of the external effects or events in this phenomenon. It actually started in July of 92 because that entire month I felt watched. And I didn't know by who or what, but I felt watched enough that I started carrying a gun outside with me on my property. Since that time, August, I had sightings with my mom. And then after that, different things would happen. I had electrical problems that were just almost unbelievable. I had phone problems, static phone cutoffs. I began to have copters go overhead in the middle of the night at all hours of the day and circle and, and buzz my house low enough that it caused cracks in all my float, float seams. Um, I've had um, several telepathic encounters and my telepathy and other psi abilities have increased. 
I've heard unexplained noises like poltergeist-type things with big two-by-fours breaking in the air and beeps, rings, electronic noises, just about anything you can think of. I've had marks appear on me, which I still have. Synchronicity, synchronistic events have <laughs> increased a thousandfold. I've experienced missing time. I've uh, seen flashing rips of light in the air at night at my house. I've had black blobs float above me. I, I had a blue light land about 300 foot behind my house. There's, I've had items um, missing and returned, odd, odd items. Uh, uh, there are nu <coughs> numerous other, other examples of these things that I've experienced. Uh, it's been amazing. Describe a little of the involvement of other family members. Well, I've seen my first UFOs with my mom. The next UFOs I saw about a month or so later was with my sister, and I've seen some with my nephew. Um, I'm also aware of a cousin who has seen a U had a UFO sighting, and um, I'm not sure about how many others in my family since this is such a new interest for me. Uh, not only has my... Um, current family um, had these sightings and things with me. There is an extensive family history on both sides of my family uh, that goes back 150 to 200 years and stories of um, poltergeist effects, telepathy, precognitive dreams, uh, little men in black clothes appearing to warn of disasters, um, all sorts of stories. Uh, my immediate aunt uh, tell stories of uh, women in white appearing in her room at the, uh, in the middle of the night and uh, all sorts of clairvoyance and precognitive things. It runs through our family. And In fact, I had always told these stories at parties when I was younger. It was uh, fun to, to talk about and things that people in our family said had happened to them. I never really took them seriously until after I saw my first UFOs. I'm Polly in Kyle's book, and my youngest son is Sam. Sam is part Cherokee and has mythical experiences associated with Native American spirituality, in addition to having experiences with UFOs. I'm a widow in my late 40s, a landscape and seascape painter. For survival, I work for a building contractor and a landscaper. If you, like us, have been drawn into the realm of aliens and UFOs, then probably, like us, you seek to understand your involvement in this other dimensional reality and its involvement in you. Sometimes it seems more that aliens and UFOs have entered our reality as when we have seen UFOs while driving through the mountains have felt impelled to go to a certain lookout point and have interacted with beings very different from ourselves within the context of our familiar surroundings. At other times we have felt drawn one sucked up into their reality, a dizzying experience, not knowing if they took our minds from our bodies or if they translated minds and bodies together into some other dimension, but knowing profoundly that we had been taken. Every twist and turn of our innermost being, every secret we ever tried to keep from ourselves had been taken, held in the cold power of their frail, omnipotent hands. Why? What is this insanity which defies all our notions of safety and law? They are becoming us, and we are becoming them. When they mate with us, when they take our eggs and our sperm, when they take our fears and our ideals and mirror them back to us in a thousand flashing images, they are becoming us, and we are becoming them. But I have been asked to share a few experiences with you not speculate on the nature of our experiences. In January of 1987, I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to see two beings about four foot tall standing in front of the south window. They both wore black or dark charcoal gray hoods and robes. The hoods apparently covered their faces, all but their large, slanted, almond-shaped, 
glowing lemon yellow eyes. These eyes had no pupils. The one to my left stood slightly forward of the one to my right, and the robe of the one to my left seemed blacker than that of the other. I was able to move and leaped off the end of the bed saying, holy shit, this is real. I went down the hall to the room of my eldest son, who was then 17. Because of the black robes, I exclaimed, I've just seen the Grim Reaper. My son said, so did I. And although I said Grim Reaper in the singular, my son then described the same two beings that I had seen. The only difference was that he said that he had seen them in his mind. After a while, I went back to the room where I had been sleeping. My large dog and I sat on the floor at the foot of the bed with all the lights on. I would lean back and close my eyes from time to time. At one point I opened my eyes and there were the same two figures. My dog saw them and looked back and forth at one and the other, sniffing loudly. Apparently she was trying to pick up their scent. They said nothing and I asked them nothing. I just wanted them to leave and told them so quite rudely. I alternately quoted scripture at them, declared the presence of God, and cursed at them. Still they stood there, gazing toward me and my dog, with their glowing lemon yellow eyes. Finally they decided to leave. They turned in unison, glided through my second son's toy box, turned again in unison, proceeded out to the hall, and descended the front staircase, the slightly blacker robed one in the lead. After they had left, my eldest son entered the room where they had appeared. He had gone to sleep after the first encounter and had not reawakened until the end of my tirade toward them. After this, we experienced a significant increase in poltergeist activity in this large Victorian house. Objects would disappear. All four children would help me hunt them. Then often they would reappear right where we knew we had looked. Sometimes they would reappear in totally inappropriate places, like legal documents in a refrigerator. Other times they never reappeared. My daughter, beginning at age eight, almost nine, when this visit occurred, developed strong abilities of psychokinesis. She would turn electrical appliances on and off simply by thinking of turning them on and off when she was in another room from the appliance. She would approach a door hook, think of unhooking it, and it would fly up out of the eye it had been hooked into. Friends and relatives both observed her doing this, much to her dismay. Sadly, her energies were so strong that small animals in her care either died or became paralyzed. We had five yellow ducklings, and all she did was point to one and say, that one is mine, and it immediately fell over and was partially paralyzed from that time until its death the following winter. I managed to nurse it back to partial health, and it grew and developed white feathers but could never wild. My daughter hated having this strange power and consciously worked to suppress it, so I don't know if it would have faded without her effort. She also sought prayer from Christian friends. For several years after this visitation, our phones would ring several times a day with no one responding when we said hello. All there was on the line was an electronic sounding sort of crackling noise. The children reported occasionally hearing strange voices, but they could not make out what was said. In the summer of 1989, two lights, which I call watcher lights, began appearing outside my bedroom window every night, a little after midnight. I would awaken and see them. A friend who was visiting also saw them on many occasions. They appeared to be across the street and slightly above some trees. They were larger than bright stars up here. Once I was wondering what they were, and one of them zipped over closer to its partner, then did other very quick movements and reversals of direction. They would both do this from time to time. By morning they would be gone. I have had many other experiences as well, but this incident I have mentioned here seemed to me to be related. I have also spoken with what I call elves in their spooky way of communicating, and have had experiences with large beings crashing through the woods and stomping on our front porch. I have watched Air Force fighter reconnaissance planes apparently in pursuit of UFOs as we stood on a mountain 
observing three consecutive nights of intense UFO activity. All of us who have contributed to Kyle's book, Taken Inside the Alien Human Abduction Agenda, want very much to help others caught up in this phenomenon. If you have been coping with this alone, please let us share our experiences with you. Please accept the help and support which Carla Turner makes available to you.